When it comes to building a gaming PC, it can be tricky to know where to start. With so many components to research, key performance metrics to compare, and buzzwords like bottlenecking, airflow, and latency to understand, it's hard to pick apart the important stuff and the things that just don't really matter that much. Which is why today, I'll be walking you guys through the 10 things you need to know before building a gaming PC, which I also hope will answer some of the biggest questions I get on a daily basis. Let's do this. Take your build to the next level with APACE's sleek RGB DDR5 memory. Available with a wide range of speeds and capacities, the APACE Panther lineup has a kit for everyone. A great looking aluminium alloy heatsink offers excellent heat dissipation, while Intel XMP 3.0 and AMD Expo certification means this RAM is a great fit for Team Red and Team Blue systems. Plus, RGB support in Asus, Gigabyte, MSI and ASRock software suites makes this an easy addition to any build. Learn more at the first link in the description below. You can of course use the timestamps below to skip through each of the 10 things I'll be covering, but I think they're all really important in their own right. Now the first thing you guys need to know is something you might not want to hear, and that's that building a gaming PC won't necessarily be cheaper than buying a pre-built, and it certainly won't be cheaper like for like than buying a console. Now to be clear, I'm not suggesting you watching this video should ditch your gaming PC dreams and go out and buy a PS5. No, not in the slightest. But building a gaming PC is not as cheap as it used to to be and while you can still build a great value system there will very often be pre-builts that may actually offer more performance per dollar. Now the reason for this is that a lot of these pre-built companies or system integrators actually get big discounts on last gen hardware such as AMD's older Ryzen 5000 CPUs and associated motherboards and often use no-name cases, power supplies and coolers. Now that's not to say that those components are terrible and they're going to explode or anything along those lines. But on the lower end of the pre-built market in particular, you'll often see unbranded components, which they use to bring the price down. Now for these reasons, building yourself is going to provide better upgrade paths, often use more modern generations of hardware, and in my mind, still be the all round better solution. But not all pre-built gaming PCs are bad, and not all of them are poor value for money. The second one, and this is another hard truth, is that whatever gaming PC you build, it's gonna have a bottleneck. Now, a bottleneck really is a constraining factor. It's something in a system that holds the rest of the PC back. An extreme example of this would be to take, say, an RTX 4090 and pair it up with an Intel Core i3 CPU. Fundamentally, the CPU is so low power that it's going to reach 100% usage well before the GPU ever does. Now, you can get a well-balanced combo. You can get a Ryzen 7 7800X 3D, pair it up with a 4090, and you're going to minimize that bottleneck significantly. And the lower the percentage of bottleneck you can achieve, the better. But your bottleneck also depends on other factors like memory, potentially even storage when it comes to SSD speed, and it massively depends on the game that you're playing. A great example of this is the RTX 4060, a card that's received a lot of grief due to its 8GB of video memory. Now in some titles, the memory is not a problem, and you can see for Hogwarts Legacy, which are quite VRAM intensive, the VRAM is a massive issue, and actually prevents the GPU core from running at its maximum speed because there's not enough memory left for the GPU to operate efficiently. The main the main thing is about minimizing the bottleneck and trying not to make silly mistakes by say not getting enough memory, you should get 32 gigs, not 16, and by not getting a fast enough SSD. As far as the CPU and GPU goes, the likelihood is one of these is going to hold back the other and that may change on a game by game, resolution by resolution, and setting by setting scenario. Minimize the bottleneck, but you definitely are not going to get rid of it. There are other really great ways of throwing away free performance too, which brings me on to point number three, airflow matters, and it matters more than you think. Now airflow is in essence the amount of air that can flow through your system, whether that be via the use of fans which are going to actively pull the air in, or by the ability to have passive airflow where you've got plenty of ventilation that just keeps the system that little bit cooler. Now at the budget end of the case market, this is where people often make big mistakes, and why the number of fans included really matters. Now if you don't have good enough airflow, the fans that you do have will have to run faster and louder to compensate, and worst case you could actually see CPU and GPU temperatures that introduce Thermal throttling. Thermal throttling is basically where the component is running too hot and actually has to slow itself down to protect itself from overheating. Now on most mid-range components, thermal throttling is fairly uncommon. CPU usage doesn't tend to be super high during gaming scenarios, so you shouldn't have huge temperature issues there, and the GPUs have often got large and sophisticated coolers that do a fantastic job, but starve your build of air, and it's a really great way of throwing away free performance. 
What's more, more airflow means cooler temperatures and a bit more overclocking headroom too, and a better ability for the CPU to boost past its core clock speed and up to its higher boost clock for more performance. Talking of CPUs, and the fourth thing to know before building a gaming PC is how many CPU cores do you actually need? The answer is not that many. Now, most CPUs come with at least six or eight cores. Ryzen 5 starts at six, Intel's Core i5 is well above this, and it's only really Intel's i3 range of CPUs that have four cores. Now, for gaming, six or eight cores tends to be fairly adequate. Eight cores is where I would position for most mid-range and high-end builds, but on the budget end, six cores tends to be more than sufficient. It's very easy to look at metrics and go, what well, more must mean better? And yes, some of these higher end Intel CPUs, when they aren't hugely overheating, do give you a performance advantage with their additional cores. But very often this advantage is best seen in productivity applications like rendering and video editing than it is in gaming. Now that's not to say that more cores is bad, it certainly isn't, but it's actually about the speed of the cores you do have which matters more for gaming scenarios. You can see this particularly when you play older titles like CSGO, it's only using one or two threads of the CPU and you can change Check this for yourself by opening Task Manager, right clicking and changing the graph to be split down by threads. 8 cores and 16 threads is about where you want to be for most fairly high end builds and you'll find for gaming you actually don't need any more than this. While we're on the subject of CPUs, let's also broach one of the biggest questions you might have. Is AMD or Intel better? Now this is a particularly controversial question at the moment given the current landscape whereby Intel are having quite a few problems. And when I say quite a few I mean many, many problems. Now take Take that out of the equation slightly, look at the bigger long term picture and here's what's going on. Intel will give you more cores, typically higher power consumption, and they tend to lead the way, but not always, with clock speed, helping with the single thread side too. AMD Ryzen gives you less cores, better value, and comparable gaming performance to what you'll find on Intel. If I was looking to build a video editing machine with as many cores as possible, the truth is I'd probably go for Intel. Things like Thunderbolt support also massively help that argument for those enthusiast use cases. But for gaming, the difference is fairly negligible. Now the advantage AMD have got is all around the platform. AMD are currently using their AM5 socket. Now this is a socket which was used for the last gen Ryzen 7000 and upcoming and newer Ryzen 9000 CPUs but AMD have guaranteed support for this until at least 2027 I meaning future Ryzen 10,000 or 11,000 CPUs will use the same socket design. Now in easy to understand terminology that means if you buy a Ryzen chip now you'll be able to upgrade to a higher end Ryzen chip later without changing any of your other hardware. Intel tend to change their socket more commonly. We typically see two CPU generations though recently we or three, but it's kind of two and a half. It's complicated, okay? Intel get through sockets quicker than AMD. AMD will also offer you overclocking support on their more budget-oriented B-series chipset, which I personally think is a massive value add. Even if you're not looking to push your CPU to its maximum, it's nice to have a little bit of headroom where you can. Now, while we're on the controversial subjects, let's also do AMD versus Nvidia. What do you need to know about the battle between the two big GPU giants, and which brand should you opt for in your next build? Now, technically, there are three players in the GPU space, AMD, Nvidia, and more recently, Intel, but the Arc lineup is, it's a bit like Intel's 14th gen CPUs. It has potential, but it's got a few problems. Now, Arc, I think in future, is gonna be a real, real one to watch. Right now, they're not really in the picture that much. AMD versus Nvidia then, which is better? The short answer, neither. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. But let me walk you through what they are, because I appreciate you want an answer. Nvidia have got their RTX 40 series, which is their latest generation, and AMD have their Radeon RX 7000 series. AMD's 7000 series starts at about 260. $69. Nvidia starts at 299 while the top end card from AMD clocks in at under $1,000, while Nvidia's RTX 4090 is sizably more expensive. If you want the best of the best, Nvidia is what you're going to buy. The RTX 4090 is currently pretty unrivaled. If you want to spend less than this and you like features like ray tracing, again, Nvidia is where I would go, but for most of the budget and mid range market, AMD have got it pretty sewn up. You don't get as good ray tracing on AMD GPUs, and their AI upscaling tech, which is called FSI for AMD and DLSS for Nvidia isn't as good on those team red GPUs. But for 1440p and 1080p gaming in particular, AMD is where I would place my stake in the ground. Typically, AMD will give you faster rasterization performance and more video memory, while Nvidia has a better, more well-rounded feature set and far superior ray tracing support too. You'll have noticed I've talked quite extensively about memory in this video, but more in the context 
context of video memory than actual standard system memory, often known as DRAM. Which brings me on to my next thing you need to know, how much memory do you need? I'm gonna keep this really simple, 32 gigabytes. A bit more detail might be good, James. Okay, let me elaborate. Just building on a real, real budget, 16 gigs is what you're gonna go for if you're spending well under a thousand, like under seven, under $600 on a build. Above that, 32 gigs is absolutely what you need. High-end video editing may need more, 64, even 128 gigs, but for gaming, 32 gigs is absolutely what you want. For DDR5, latency really matters. To so aim for closer to 30 than for 40. And as far as speed goes, you wanna be in the region of 6,000 mega transfers for DDR5 and about 3,600 megahertz for DDR4. But in short, 32 gigs. That's the amount of memory you should opt for in your build. There is one more kind of memory to consider, and I appreciate this is getting a bit confusing. We've done VRAM, we've done DRAM. Now it's the long-term system memory, often referred to as storage. Now, when it comes to storage in a build, speed matters more now than ever before. Graphics cards and CPUs are getting so quick and so powerful that it's important they can read game data fast enough to avoid a storage-inflicted bottleneck. For me, I would recommend a drive with at least a 4,000 megabyte read speed. This is very easy to get right now. These Gen 4 drives like Crucial P3 Plus, WD's SN770, Team Group's MP44L are all such good value. And I'll link my favorite entry level options down below. Getting a fast SSD also just massively improves the day to day usability of your system. And going for an older SATA SSD or SATA hard drive just isn't really acceptable for a lot of builds nowadays. And given the cost implication, there's really no need. Pretty much every area of the build covered off, apart from one really important and often overlooked element power supplies. Two points to cover here. The first is how how to calculate how much wattage you need when shopping for a power supply. Head to the manufacturer's webpage of your GPU and look at the recommended GPU power supply requirements. This will have been tested with a like for like CPU and GPU config and gives you a good indicative figure. The other thing to do is use a site like PC Part Picker where you can key in all your components and it'll give you an estimated system power consumption. Make sure you add about 30 to 40% to this figure as power supply efficiency ratings will actually lose some of the wattage that they advertise to output to ensure you've got enough headroom. For most builds you're going to want on the budget end at least 650, on the mid-range 7 or 850 and on the top end more like a thousand watts. Follow your GPU manufacturer's webpage but take into account that if your system has 10 hard drives, loads of memory, a million fans, you're going to need a bit more power than what the GPU website states. Similarly if you've got a beefy CPU upgrade or you're looking to do a load of overclocking, take this into account too. Finally the other thing to cover off, the number 10 on this list is again power supplies. What on earth ATX 3.0 actually means. Now you'll see this ATX3 word banded about a lot at the moment and this all comes down to a new power supply standard which is being spearheaded by Intel and it's one of the things right now they've actually got really right. Now ATX3 defines the new standards and efficiency levels a power supply needs to meet. It works on things like massively reducing idle power consumption, great for your energy bills, and in exchange also gives you the native PCI Gen 5 power connector. This is really great for Nvidia GPUs, AMD cards currently still use the older style. So there's 10 things I think you really need to consider before building your next gaming PC. I know some of these might not be things people want to hear, but I think it's important to cover them nevertheless. If you're on a journey to build a gaming PC, get subscribed. We'll do loads of that around here and have hopefully a few more videos that might help you out. If you're a regular viewer, thanks for sticking with us. Over 205,000 subscribers now, which is frankly ridiculous. Let me know if you agreed with all my points today or if I missed anything in the comments below. And as always, we'll see you in the next GeekerWatt video.